our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Messiah hath redeemed us from the curse of the Torah law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Curse is everyone that hangeth on a tree. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24 Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Acts chapter 5 verse 30 The Isiohim of our fathers raised up Yeshia, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. the Bible say Yeshaya, whom most people mistakenly call Jesus? Why does the Bible say that Yeshaya was hung from a tree instead of a Roman cross? We shall discover the answer using our main source book regarding the Christ, the Holy Bible. Shalom brothers and sisters and welcome to Captivity in Christ Church the Bible Unveil series, The Crucifixion Tree Redemption. Was the anointed Christ crucified on a living growing tree or a Roman cross? Many believers have many questions, but very few answers. Many don't know the answer at all and rely on their church leader to give them the answer. Movies and television firmly implant into believers' mind that Christ was nailed to a Roman cross between two criminals, two sinners whom one admitted deserved the death that awaited them. Please open your Bible to Luke Chapter 23, verses 32, 33, 39 through 41. So we can read that even one of the criminals admitted Christ's innocence. Reading from Luke chapter 23, verses 32. And 33. And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Moving on to verse 39 of the same chapter. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Messiah, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear a higher, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man 
hath done nothing amiss. The cross that Christ was supposedly crucified on is called an emissary, which means that the vertical trunk extended a certain height above the traverse beam. The Merriam-Webster dictionary definition of emissa is a cross of crucifixion in which the top of the upright shaft extends above the traverse beam. Christ's cross was much higher than the crosses of the two criminals, thus suggesting Christ's crime was graver than the two criminals. We have all seen the pictures of the crucifixion. Christ in the center, the two criminals, one on Christ's left hand and the other criminal on Christ's right hand, three Roman crosses in the background. The truth is, the Bible never states there were three Roman crosses at the crucifixion site. So this next revelation may come as a shock and a surprise. Yet, the Bible never states the anointed Messiah was crucified on a Roman cross. In fact, the Bible clearly reveals that Christ and the two criminals were crucified together on a living, growing tree. The complete opposite of what you see on television, at the movies, or in paintings. Nothing whatsoever is mentioned in the Bible about three Roman crosses and any of the four Gospels. Go back and reread Luke chapter 23 verses 32 and 33 and you will discover all Luke says is there they crucify him along with the criminals one on his right hand and the other on his left it has been assumed that three crosses were employed at the crucifixion site. So, a person should ask, are there any Bible verses that prophesy about Christ's crucifixion on the tree from the Old Testament leading into the New Testament? There's a commandment in Deuteronomy chapter 21 verse 23 regarding a crucifixion and it reads, His body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is a curse of Ishiohim, that thy land be not defiled, which Ahiah thy Ishiohim giveth thee for an inheritance. A body could not remain upon the crucifixion tree overnight or for several days or for weeks at a time. You had to bury that person's body that very same day of death so the land would not be defiled. May I share with you a few of the Bible prophecies fulfilled by the persecution and crucifixion of Christ? Christ was betrayed by a friend. In Psalm chapter 41 verse 9, King David wrote about a betrayal at the hand of a close friend with whom he had shared bread. 
This foreshadowed something that happened years later with Christ. As explained in Matthew chapter 26, verse 47 through 50, Yeshua was betrayed by Judas, one of the 12 apostles. Shortly after, Yeshua and the apostles shared bread during the Last Supper. Allow me to read the verse. Psalm chapter 41, verse 9. Yea, my all familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. Verse fulfillment. Matthew chapter 26. Verse 47 through 50. Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And the highest said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price, that I was pressed at of them. And I took the thirty pieces of silver, and cast them to the potter, and the house of Ahiah. The prophet Zechariah gives a prophecy involving thirty pieces of silver. Christ was betrayed by Judas with a kiss five hundred years later after Zechariah prophecy. Judas told the Romans the most appealing time to arrest Christ when he, Christ, was not surrounded by a large gathering of people. Verse fulfillment, Matthew chapter 26, verse 15. Later, overwhelmed with guilt, Judas tossed the 30 pieces of silver into the temple and went and hanged himself. The blood money was used to buy a potter's field, a burial place for foreigners. First fulfillment, Matthew chapter 27, verses 5 through 7. After Judas' death, a new disciple was needed to fill Judas' former position. Psalm Chapter 109, verse 6. Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. Verse fulfillment, Acts chapter 1, verse 20. Christ was beaten, mocked, taunted, and spat on shortly before his crucifixion. In Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, a servant of Ahiah endures abuse at the hands of a sinful people. This servant offered his back to those who beat him, his face to those who ripped out his beard and himself to those who mocked and taunted him. Reading from Isaiah chapter 50 verse 6, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Verse Fulfillment, Matthew, chapter 26, verse 67. Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 7. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, 
so he'd open not his mouth. A prophet and servant of a higher would be afflicted and accused, but like a lamb led to the slaughter, he would remain silent. First fulfillment, Matthew chapter 27 verses 12 through 14. Isaiah chapter 53 verses 4 through 6 Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we did esteem him stricken smitten of Ishiohim and afflicted but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the higher has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his stripes we were healed of our sins. Christ was crucified for our sins, yet he was completely humble and sinless. His ultimate sacrifice redeemed us from our sins. No longer was lambs and other animals needed. Fallen man has been healed since sin can no longer be our burden and separation from Ahia due to Christ's crucifixion. First fulfillment, First Peter chapter 2 verses 24 and 25. Psalm chapter 22. I would suggest that you read the whole chapter. There are many verses that pertains to the crucifixion. Psalm chapter 22 gives the most accurate description of a person being crucified. Written about 1,000 years before Christ's birth, Christ was numbered with the transgressors. His hands and feet were impaled. His side was pierced. He was mauled and disfigured. Reading a few verses from Psalm chapter 22, beginning with verse 1. My Ishi, my Ishi, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. Psalm chapter 22, verse 7 and 8. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, He trusted on a higher that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, saying he delighted in him. Psalm chapter 22, verses 16, 17, and 18. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierce my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me, they part my garments among them, and cast lots upon my vesture. First Fulfillment, John chapter 19. Verses 23, 34, and 37. Additional New Testament verses include Luke chapter 23, verses 33, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. 
and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. The Hebrew word for bitterness is Mera. In the strong concordance of the Bible, you can look up number H4843. Mera, be bitter, be in bitterness, deal bitterly, have bitterness, make bitter, bitterly, be moved with choler, be grieved. Have sorely grieved, is grieveth, provoke, vex. In Zechariah 12.10, people will lament over the one who was pierced. They will have a cause for mourning and grieving for the Christ. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 12 Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Christ was numbered with the transgressors Christ was not a transgressor himself. Still, he was numbered with them. He bore the shame, the mockings, and the eventual death on the tree. We also remember Christ was struck down not for his own sin, but for the sins of others. Christ bore the sins of many. He took all our sins, yours and mine, upon himself. Christ never before was separated from the Father. That is why he cried out, My Ishi, my Ishi, why hast thou forsaken me? Keep in remembrance, as he bore the sins of us all, even the Father turned away from him. Our redemption occurred because of Christ's intercession for us lowly transgressors. Christ's intercession is still occurring in this present time. Not only did the prayer to the Father asking him to forgive those that beat, taunted, and mocked Christ Christ is asking the same for us today. When we break the Father's statutes, laws, and commandments. So ask yourself this question. If you were suffering the way Christ did, would you ask the Father to forgive the people that done the crucifying the beating, the mockings, the turning to you? Or would you call on the Father and ask Him to destroy them off the face of the earth? Speaking personally, I ask the Father not for forgiveness of those people, but to destroy them. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 9 And he made his grave with the wicked 
and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Christ was numbered with the transgressors. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. Christ did not die of his own sin, but for the sins of all mankind. Christ willingly died as a malefactor and a sinner. And we are all sinners. Christ was put in a grave for sinners. Christ willingly yielded himself to death and his burial. This is similar to the humiliation of being hanged on a tree between the two criminals. Joseph of Arimathea begged for Christ's body, and Pilate readily granted Christ's body to Joseph upon his request. I will detail this information shortly about Joseph of Arimathea. Pilate never deemed Christ as a malefactor. Christ never committed no violence. It would be highly unlikely that Pilate would give his consent to Joseph of Arimathea to retain Christ's body if he was a malefactor and violent. Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. People do not regret anything until it takes a bad turn. The prophet Zechariah prophesied that the people will lament over the one whom was pierced. There will be a time for great mourning and grieving. The people shall heartily lament the crucifixion of Christ not only as a sinful, cruel act of our forefathers, but as that in which all our sins had a great share in. As one mourneth for his only son. My mother's son was murdered, as was my sister's only son. This is a deep, long-continuing, lasting sorrow. This type of sorrow is retained inwardly and expressed outwardly. Even after the funeral, there is that unfeigned, very real, and great long sorrow. And with it, the regret that always continues and shall be in bitterness for him true repentance will bitterly lament the sins that brought sorrows and pain upon the son of Ahia Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 64 And Ahiah shall scatter thee among all people from one end of the earth even unto the other and there thou shalt serve other gods which neither thou nor thy fathers have known even wood and stone. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 28 and there ye shall serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, 
nor smell. One of the highest curses was that he would exile the Hebrew Israelites to a land where they would worship wood and stone and serve gods, man-made gods, that they nor their fathers never known before, even wood and stone. The Hebrews had no desire to serve Ahia with cheerfulness, so they would be compelled to serve the man-made gods of their enemies. First, during the Babylonian captivity and when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans, the Hebrews were plucked off the land and scattered throughout the four corners of the earth and forbidden to set foot back into Jerusalem. They had no rest on either side no rest of body, and continuously persecuted. Banished from city to city and from country to country. Recalled and banished again. So, the wood many have surmised is the cross, and the stone, the cobblestone, and Mecca. The Hebrews is trapped between two of the largest and most popular religions in the earth today. Christianity and Islam. Who are the modern day children of the Hebrew Jews that were so rebellious against the Most High God? That answer can easily be found in Deuteronomy chapter 28 Verse 68 And Ahia shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships by the way whereof I speak unto thee thou shalt see it no more again and there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen and no man shall buy you Bondmen and bond women is slaves. Back into Egypt again with ships. The scriptures are speaking about spiritual Egypt. Spiritual Egypt would be modern day America. Before we go into the verses of the Bible showing Christ was crucified on a tree with the two criminals, we need to know of the curses Christ freed us from because of his voluntary sacrifice. In order to get release from all the troubles that we are going through today. Deuteronomy chapter 28 is devoted to the sole purpose of the theme of blessings and curses and reveals the primary cause of each. Verses 1 and 2 deal with the cause of a highest blessing. It tells us to hearken, which means to hear, listen, obey the voice of a higher, thy Ishiohim, to observe and do all his commandments which he commands then all these blessings shall be ours. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 1 and 2 And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of Ahia, thy Ishiohim, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that Ahia, thy Ishiohim, will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of Ahia, thy Ishiohim.
We all need to understand the highest blessings proceed out of his kindness as Apostle Paul presents to us in Romans chapter 11 verse 22. Behold therefore the goodness and severity of Ahia on them which fail severity but toward thee goodness if thou continue in his goodness otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. A higher judgment proceeds out of his severity against sin. So it is very clear there is a reason for every curse. Proverbs chapter 26 verse 2 As a bird by wandering, as a swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. The primary reason of Christ's sacrifice was to redeem us from the curse of the Torah law. As we read in Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. Messiah hath redeemed us from the curse of the Torah law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And in Galatians chapter 4, verse 5, it reads, To redeem them that were under the Torah law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 14, communicates the blessings of Ahia as given to Moses if his chosen people are obedient to him. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 14 through 68 points to the severity of the curses if his chosen people are disobedient. If his chosen people do not keep his commandments, they would not be entitled to the blessings of Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 1 through 14. They would receive all the misery instead of the blessings. The misery of the curses would include being sold as slaves, bondmen and bondwomen, in the land of our enemies, as stated in the Apocrypha, the book of Baruch. The Apocrypha was removed from the King James 1611 Bible by our enemies. Reading from Baruch chapter 4 verses 6 and 7. Ye were sold to the nations, not for your destruction, but because ye moved Ahia to wrath. Ye were delivered unto the enemies, for ye provoked him that made you by sacrificing unto devils and not to Ahia. Understand the curses of Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 14 through 68 affected all the twelve sons of Jacob, all the twelve tribes, and their future generations. These are the curses that Yeshua Christ's sacrifice redeemed us from. Reading Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 14 through 68. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of Ahia thy Ishiohim, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee.
cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. Ahiah shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke, and all that thou settest thine hand unto, for to do, until thou be destroyed, and until thou perish quickly, because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. Ahiah shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee until he hath consumed thee from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. Ahiah shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever and with an inflammation and with an extreme burning and with the sword and with blasting and with mildew and they shall pursue thee until thou perish. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. Ahiah shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. From heaven it shall come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. Ahiah shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them, and flee seven ways before them, and shall be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. And thy carcass shall be meat unto all the fowls of the air, and unto the beasts of the earth, and no man shall flay them away. Ahiah will smite thee with the blotch of Egypt, and with the emeralds, and with the scab, and with the itch, whereof thou canst not be healed. Ahiah shall smite thee with madness, and blindness, and astonishment of heart. And thou shalt grope at noonday, as the blind gropeth in darkness. And thou shalt not prosper in thy ways. And thou shalt only be oppressed and spoiled evermore, and no man shall save thee. Thou shalt be wrought the wife, and another man shall lie with her. Thou shalt build an house, and thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and shalt not gather the grapes thereof. Thine ox shall be slain before thine eyes, and thou shalt not eat thereof. Thine ass shall be violently taken away from before thy faith, and shall not be restored to thee. Thy sheep shall be given unto thine enemies, and thou shalt have none to rescue them. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all day long, and there shall be no might and thine hand. The fruit of thy land and all thy labors shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and thou shalt only be oppressed and crushed alway, so that thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. A higher shall smite thee in the knees and in the legs with a sore botch that cannot be healed, from the sole of thy foot unto the top of thy head. Ahiah shall bring thee, and thy king which thou shalt set over thee, unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. And there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone. And thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword, among all the nations whither Ahiah shall lead thee. Thou shalt carry much seed 
out into the field and shall gather but little in, for the locusts shall consume it. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but shalt neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. Thou shalt have olive tree throughout all thy coasts, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with the oil, for thine olive shall cast his fruit. Thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but thou shalt not enjoy them, for they shall go into captivity. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which Ahiah shall sin against thee, in hunger, and in thirst, and in nakedness, and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck, until he have destroyed thee. Ahiah shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce continents which shall not regard the person of the old, nor shew favor to the young. And he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee neither corn, wine, or oil, or the increase of thy kind, or flocks of thy sheep, until he have destroyed thee. And he shall besiege thee, and all thy gates, until thy high and fenced walls come down, wherein thou trustest, throughout all thy land. And he shall besiege thee, and all thy gates throughout all thy land, which Ahia thy Ishiohim hath given thee. And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters, which Ahia thy Ishiohim hath given thee, and the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee, so that the man that is tender among you, and very delicate, his eyes shall be evil toward his brother, and toward the wife of his bosom, and toward the remnant of his children, which he shall lead, so that he will not give any of them of the flesh of his children, whom he shall eat, because he hath nothing left and the siege, and in the straightness, wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee and all thy gates. The tender and delicate woman among you, which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness, her eyes shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom, and toward her son, and toward her daughter, and toward her young one that cometh out from between her feet, and toward her children which she shall bear. 
for she shall eat them for want of all things secretly in the siege and straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee and thy gates. If thou would not observe to do all the words of this Torah law that are written in this book that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name Ahia thy Ishiohim then Ahia will make thy plagues wonderful and the plagues of thy seed even great plagues and of long continuance and sore sicknesses and of long continuance. Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt which thou was afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. Also, every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this law, them will Ahiah bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. And ye shall be left few in number, whereas ye were as the stars of heaven for multitude, because thou wouldest not obey the voice of Ahiah thy Ishiohim. And it shall come to pass that as Ahiah rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so Ahiah will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught, and ye shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. And Ahiah shall scatter thee among all people from one end of the earth even unto the other, and there thou shalt serve other gods which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations thou shalt find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But Ahiah shall give thee there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shalt have none assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would it shall hang, it were even. And at even thou shalt say, Would it shall hang, it were morning. For the fear of thine heart, wherewith thou shalt fear. And for the sight of thine eyes, which thou shalt see. And Ahiah shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. By the way whereof I speak unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again. And there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen. And no man shall buy you. Pictured are the three types of crosses commonly used by the Roman army in the first century AD. Each had an inscription stating the victim's capital offense. Each had a seat-like projection, not for the victim's comfort, but to prolong their agony. Nails and ropes held the victim's arms and legs in place. The cross on the left was called a high tau cross. Its shape was like the capital Greek letter T. The middle cross was known as a low tau cross, shaped like a lowercase t. The central post was generally set permanently in the ground while the crossbar was carried to the site by the victim. The cross on the right was an actual tree still in the ground, dead or alive, 
with this limb serving as the crossbar. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 3 and 4 For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received how that Messiah died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures Mark chapter 8 verse 34 and when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also he said unto them whosoever will come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me John chapter 3 verse 16 for Ahia so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life Mark chapter 15 verse 30 save thyself and come down from the cross Matthew chapter 10 verse 38 and he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 I am crucified with Messiah nevertheless I live yet not I but Messiah liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the son of Ahiah who loved me and gave himself for me. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18 For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness but unto us which are saved it is the power of a higher. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 But a higher commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners Messiah died for us Luke chapter 23 verse 43 and Yeshua said unto him verily I say unto thee today shalt thou be with me in paradise Matthew chapter 17 verse 17 then Yeshua answered and said O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. Since we have explored the biblical verses pertaining to the cross, using the strong accordance of the Bible, let us seek the original terminology of the meaning of cross from the Greek. The first word, prospagony, G4362, to fasten, to impale on a cross, crucify, reference, G. 4314 and G 4078. The next word is Storo. G 4717. To impale on the cross. Figuratively. To extinguish, subdue, passion, or selfishness. Crucify. Reference. G 47 16 Storus G 47 16 A stake or post as set upright 
In example, specifically, a pole or cross as an instrument of capital punishment, figuratively, exposure to death. In example, self-denial by implication, the atonement of Christ's cross. Reference G2476. I mentioned before an emissa without any details. An emissa spelled I M M I S S A is a cross of crucifixion in which the top of the upright shaft extends above the traverse beam. It is also called a cross capitata. You can also compare it to a cross camisa, cross discustata, or Latin cross. You can find this information in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. The pictures, images of an emissa have been provided. Bible theologists say there are discrepancies in the Bible as to whether Christ was crucified on a Roman cross or a living growing tree. According to Peter, Christ was crucified on a living growing tree. Acts chapter 5 verse 30. The Ishiohim of our fathers raised up Yeshia whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Acts chapter 10 verse 39 And we are all witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Acts chapter 13 verse 29 and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulchre. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 Messiah hath redeemed us from the curse of the Torah law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24 Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Our final verse is Deuteronomy chapter 21 Verse 23, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt anywise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is a curse of Ishiohim, that thy land be not defiled, which Ahia, thy Ishiohim, giveth thee for an inheritance. Just maybe the discrepancies come from the misunderstanding of the Greek word exulon, which means wood. Using our strong concordance of the Bible, let's turn to G3586 and investigate the meaning of wood or exulon, timber as fuel or material, by implication a stick, club or tree or other wooden article or substance staff, 
stock, tree, wood. You can also reference G3582. These are the Bible verses that state Yeshua Christ was crucified on a Roman cross. Matthew chapter 27 verse 40 And saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the son of Ishiohim, come down from the cross. Matthew chapter 27 verse 42 he saved others. Himself he could not save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. Mark chapter 15 verse 30 Save thyself and come down from the cross. Mark Chapter 15, verse 32. Let Messiah, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. Luke, chapter 23, verse 26. And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross, that he might bear it after Yeshua. John, chapter 19, verse 19. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Yeshia, a Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Saint Helena, discoverer of the true cross, as researched by A. R. Burley. Helena, later known as Flavia, Julia, Helena, Augusta, mother of Constantine the Great was credited after her death with having discovered the fragments of the cross and the tomb in which Christ was buried at Golgotha. Helena was born at Drapanium in Blithnia, later renamed after her Helenopolis about the year 250. Constantine's biographer, Bishop Eusebius, of Caesarea reports that Helena was converted to Christianity by her son. She received the title Most Noble Lady at least in AD 318 and coins with her name and this title and her portrait were struck in modest quantities. Shortly after Constantine gained control of the whole empire in A.D. 324, Helena, together with Constantine's wife, Fosca, were raised to the rank of Augusta. She took the imperial name Flavia and Julia. Inscriptions from the basis of statues in her honor call her Our Lady Flavia Augusta Helena, and coins bearing her name and portrait were now issued in greater quantities. In A.D. 326, Constantine's eldest son and only child by his first wife, 
Manavina, Crispus, who had already been raised to the rank of Caesar, was suddenly sentenced to death by Constantine and executed at Pola and Istria. The real reason for Crispus' condemnation will no doubt never be known. Sources hostile to Constantine claim that his stepmother, Foster, had fallen in love and that when Crispa repulsed her advances, she accused him of attempted rape. This version is doubtless invented for the separate reason that Crispus had been in the West at Traer while Foster was with Constantine in the East. However, Foster may well have played a part in turning Constantine against her stepson in the interest of her own sons. Hence, it is no surprise that when Constantine arrived in Rome ten days after Crispus' death on the 15th of July, 326, to celebrate the 20th anniversary of his first assumption of the purple, Helena intervened. She appeared before Constantine, dressing in mourning clothes, and either revealing to him the facts that he did not know, or at any rate, planted the seeds of suspicion against Foster. Shortly afterwards, Foster was suffocated in the steam room of the palace baths, having evidently decided to commit suicide. Helena now had no rival as the first lady of the empire. Constantine would soon rename her birthplace Drapanium after her, and another Hellenopolis was created in Palestine. Indeed, shortly after these violent deaths, in the imperial family, Helena set out on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Her prayers at the holy places were publicly presented in the version of Eusebius as an act of thanksgiving for the triumph of the Christian Empire. For so great a son, the emperor, and his most pious sons, the Caesars, Constantine II and Constantius II. St. Ambrose would later call her journey the pilgrimage of an anxious mother. Traveling by Syria, she came to see for herself the churches which Constantine had ordered to be built in Jerusalem and to pray there for her son. The whole imperial court had returned to the east by the spring of A.D. 327, and Helena's journey probably began in that year. No light undertaking for a woman in her late 70s. Helena's name is associated in the history of the church with the legend that she found the true cross on which Christ was crucified. The increased reverence for the cross as a symbol of Christian belief during the Constantinian period naturally played a role here. But neither the author of the pilgrimage from Border Rocks of A.D. 333, nor Eusebius, who died in A.D. 339, refers to the relics of the cross. The former mentions only the Rock of Golgotha, the Holy Sepulchre, and the New Basilicus of Constantine. The circumstances of the discovery and Helena's role in it were evidently beginning to crystallize in both the East and the West, well before the end of the 4th century. Helena died at Rome, probably and 330 A.D., not long after 
returning from her pilgrimage. She was about 80 years old. I have shortened a lesson on St. Helena because I desire for you to do some research of your own into this fascinating woman. The report I used is from A.R. Burley entitled St. Helena, Discoverer of the True Cross. Did Christ's crucifixion take place on a tree or a Roman cross? I shared the scriptures that was written by the Apostle Peter. Acts chapter 5 verse 30. Acts chapter 10 verse 39. Acts chapter 13 verse 29. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. I also covered the Old Testament scriptures. Deuteronomy chapter 21 verse 23. I shared the report of St. Helena who was born some 200 years after the crucifixion. I shall now attempt to answer the discrepancies of the Bible. Brothers and sisters, allow me to introduce to you Joseph of Arimathea and his background according to the biblical scriptures. Joseph of Arimathea was according to the four gospels the man who donated his own prepared tomb for the burial of Yeshua Christ after his crucifixion. According to Mark chapter 15 verse 43, Joseph of Arimathea was a respected member of the council who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 27 verse 57 described him as a rich man and disciple of Jesus, whose Hebrew name is Yeshua. According to John chapter 19, verse 38, upon hearing of Yeshua's death, this secret disciple asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Christ. And Pilate gave him his permission. Joseph immediately purchased a linen shroud, Mark chapter 15, verse 46, and proceeded to Golgotha to take the body of Christ down from the tree. There, according to John chapter 19, verse 39 through 40, Joseph and Nicodemus took the body of Christ and bound it in a linen cloth with the spices that Nicodemus had bought. The disciple then conveyed the corpse to the place previously brought for Joseph on tomb, a man-made cave hung from rock in a garden of his house nearby. This was done speedily for the Sabbath was approaching quickly. Luke chapter 23 verse 50 through 56 also mentions this event.
When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was a disciple of Jesus. Matthew chapter 27, verse 57. Reading directly from I, Joseph of Arimathea, a story of Jesus, his resurrection, and the aftermath. A documented historical novel by Frank C. Tribe. I will begin reading from page 232. As we neared the execution site, I saw a crowd of curious was already gathered. The crucifixions had already occurred, and quite some distance back stood several women of the way, and with them was my niece Mary, Jesus' mother. Reuben, I said, go ask one of the women, how does it happen that Mary bat Yohim is here from Capernaum? By a quick glance around, I saw no sign of the Galilean Twelve. Having limited understanding of national politics and the Sanhedrin, they doubtless believed that their own lives were in jeopardy. When I saw Sirach and Gamaliel standing with a few other members of the Sanhedrin, Nicodemus and I moved toward them. But seeing us, Sirach and Gamaliel came toward us, leaving the chief priests they had been with. Many members do not agree with this action, said Sirach, and most like us were not notified of the meeting. How did the soldiers treat Jesus, I asked. Brutally, very brutally, responded Sirach. I can't say that I've seen many crucifixions, commented Gamaliel, but the cruelty toward Jesus can only be described as inhuman. In what respect? asked Nicodemus. The description by Sirach caused me to stutter from shock and anger. They laid Jesus on his back on the crossbeam, the patabum, and marked where his wrists were, he began. Then, with a wood auger, they bored holes a full hand span farther apart. After spiking one wrist through the board hole, three soldiers tied a rope just above his other elbow and pulled with all their strength, while the fourth soldier waited with spike and mallet for the wrist to reach the board hole. I think Jesus must have swooned, he continued, for both of his shoulders were dislocated with a horrible sound of crunching of bone and tearing of flesh. Thus, the second wrist reached the other board hole and the second spike was driven through it. How can the Romans be so bestial? asked Nicodemus in a shocked whisper. And they even put the crown of thorns back on his head. As you can see, Sirach resumed, the three trees are stripped of branches and the top of each is cut off some five cubits from the ground. There is a notch across the top in which they passed a rope 
and thus pulled up the pad of him, with Jesus nailed to it. On the front of the tree was another notch into which the pad of him was securely nailed and roped. The next step was ingenious, as well as cruel, he continued. They used chisel and mallet to cut a hole, some three fingers deep in the tree, into which the heel of his right foot was placed. This permitted the back of the right leg to lay flat against the tree. Next, the left foot was placed over the right, in a single spike was driven through both feet into the tree. I had to look, but I couldn't look. Gamaliel added in a hoarse whisper. But what kept you two? We were making arrangements for his burial, I said. At this point, Reuben came up to report. Mary, Jesus' mother, received a message four days ago in Capernaum that was sent by Jesus himself and which bid her to come be present at his death. She presently has swooned from shock and is being ministered to by the two Marys and the other women. Sirach, I asked, when was the nailing of Jesus till the tree completed. The third hour, he replied, just at the end of the first daytime watch. The Romans, counting from midnight, will record it as the ninth hour. We have approached the last scriptural reading for today's lesson. Psalm chapter 22 verses 15 through 18. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them, and cast lots upon my vesture. This is a prophecy from King David, detailing the crucifixion of Christ on the tree. I have hopefully shown in today's lesson that there are no biblical discrepancies. You either believe what is written in the Bible or you trust in man-made religions. The choice, as always, remains up to you. From the understanding and knowledge shown me by the Holy Spirit, Yeshua Christ and the two malefactors were crucified side by side, one on Yeshua's right hand, the other on his left hand, together on a living, growing tree. There was no three separate Roman crosses at the crucifixion site. What is the significance of Christ's crucifixion on the tree? 
the scripture clearly states that he bore our sins and delivered us from the curses of Deuteronomy chapter 28. That is the good news in which I'm teaching on. No more bondage for a blood-bought, redeemed, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled Hebrew Israelite or Christian because Christ was obedient to death even on the tree we all can now command the blessings of Deuteronomy chapter 28 Verses 1 through 14. Here is a fun fact. A curse is the opposite of a blessing. My brothers and sisters, thank you so much for taking time out of your precious day to watch our first video lesson. Blessings unto you and your loved ones. If you like the lesson and learn something you never known before, send us an email to badside562 at yahoo.com we respond rapidly to any and all questions you may also list suggestions for any future lessons just contact us we'll make it happen Please share this lesson with others that you may know. And also, please do subscribe. Without you, there is no us. The next upcoming lesson is entitled, Ties is Food, According to the Bible. Shabbat Shalom Ahayim. And hear, O Israel, Ahayah, our Ishiohim, is Ahayah Akkad, one, united.